Will. Hello, White Sox fans, and welcome to another edition of the MLB Future Sox podcast slash stream. My name is Ian Eskridge. Tonight, I am joined by Nick Murawski, Danny Miller, and tonight as a special first-time guest, Elijah Evans. How you guys doing tonight? Doing great. Uh, yeah, here we are, man. Uh, pitchers and catchers reporting. Uh, feels good to feel good. Yes, indeed. Yeah, good to be here. Appreciate you guys having me on, and uh, excited to get ready for baseball season. It feels like we're finally here. Oh, that's... yeah, same. Uh, this time of year is uh, one of those one of those times that's a favorite for a lot of people, right? Unless, of course, you know you're a fan of the White Sox, uh, you know, and you're not as diehard as some of the folks in this room are. It, yeah, I should say the White Sox, and maybe I don't know Oakland. <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah good to be here good to be talking about baseball man yeah good to see you guys um so we've got uh pitchers and catchers reporting tomorrow uh there's already been the smattering of pictures amongst the uh twitter timeline which has been nice to see some interviews and uh, nice to see everybody down there and getting ready for the season um i guess i'll open this thing up with We've got a bunch of battles, I, I guess I would say. Um, how much of a battle is it really when you've got uh, a bunch of guys whose statistical worst year was last year uh, battling it out for spots on the roster? But um, there, there are some interesting things going on with the NRIs. Uh, I guess I'll open that up with the, the NRIs. Uh, is there anybody in particular – that you guys are looking forward to see. I figure we'll break down and just take a, a, a real brief snapshot of each guy after uh, after this conversation. Uh, Nick, why don't you go ahead and start? Is there somebody in particular you're looking forward to uh, checking out? Gosh, you know, honestly, it feels just like a bunch of bodies, you know, thrown up against the wall, and, like, we'll see what sticks. I mean, this off season kind of felt like, you know, quantity instead of quality. Like, let's get as many guys in. Obviously, depth has been an issue for the Chicago White Sox for a while. That has been addressed. You know, what this, what strength of depth we have, that's a whole nother question. Like, you can have depth, but what's, what's the value of that depth? Um, you know, I'm not joking around here. I, I, I like Danny Mendick. When he went down in that, in that injury with, I think, Haysley, uh, tore his knee up. He was cooking. W whether he was able to do that, you know, for the remainder of the season, doubtful. But it just felt like things were kind of unlocking for him. Uh, he can play multiple positions. And I, hey, I, in, in a year where we don't anticipate a ton of great things happening, it, it'd be great if he caught on again and he's healthy. And you know, we can find somebody that maybe even is even more than, you know, a backup at times. So it's fun to have him back for, in, in my perspective, I joke around about TWTW all the time because that's just from, from my Hawk upbringing, but I, he's a guy that I'll be paying attention to and just checking in on him. But some of the arms, you know, obviously we need to figure out, you know, where our bullpen is at and, and those types of, setup guys those types of situational pitchers they emerge sometimes out of nowhere so uh I always looking in uh on the pitching depth uh danny let's go down the line anybody in particular for you uh well you know so here's my thing you know we for years and years and years we've been talking about what's going on in right field right and last season we kind of figured maybe they got something figured out you know we we pretty much heard for months before spring and opening day came along that uh, Oscar Colas was going to be the guy and that didn't really seem to work itself out too much so you know again here we are 2024 and right field's a question but uh you know they made some moves to try to get better defensively uh that's just been kind of the focus all off season this year but my thing is looking at the 40 man roster and the list of infielders that are on the 40 man right now. And you're going, where's really, what does our infield look like? 
I mean, the only thing that you can pretty much slot in is Yuan Moncada is how long as he's healthy is going to be the starting third baseman. And Andrew Vaughn is going to be the starting first baseman unless he goes down with some kind of major injury. But then you look at the smattering of names that goes across the rest of, of what's on the 40 man and the middle infield. There's kind of at least some question marks. Obviously, you know, they went out and the big off season signing this year was uh, Paul de Dong, Paul de Young. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, Nikki Lopez. And, and for a while there, we just assumed that those guys were going to be the two up the middle, but uh, you know, there's still Lenny Sosa that's out there. Uh, there's still uh Popeye Rodriguez on the 40 man, uh, you know, Braden Shoemake, who they picked up, uh, you know, there's just, there's this whole smattering of names and none of them really jump off the page. You know what I mean? So I, I'm kind of really wanting to see what's going to happen there. Who's going to stay. Are any of those guys going to stick for the entire season? Uh, I don't know, but you know, I'm, I guess spring training numbers really don't mean a whole lot, right? But when you're looking at a White Sox 40 man that looks like this one, uh, it might actually mean something this year. I don't really know where Pedro's head's at. I don't think a lot of people know where Pedro's head's at right now. That is fair. Uh, Elijah, as a uh, fellow minor league guy, um, where you, your focus is a lot on minor league stuff, who are the guys that you're looking at currently to – possibly make a run at something here. Yeah, I mean, the obvious choice is Dick Mastrini. Um, you know, we've seen what he's capable of down the stretch last season. He came to the organization, was good in Birmingham, was solid again in Charlotte, had a few more issues in Charlotte. But generally speaking, this is a guy who's advanced. He looks pretty ready to be at the highest level of baseball. Um, you know, it's going to come down to how much he can command, and it's going to be interesting to see, you know, in his bullpens and then in training games, how much he's able to locate within the zone, especially with his fastball and his changeup. Um, that's really what's going to be the deciding factor for him. I think because of all the veteran starters, the Sox might hold off on bringing him into the opening day rotation and choose to kind of have him be the next man up the second that somebody struggles or goes down with an injury. Um, but I think Estrini is the most exciting in terms of somebody that could actually benefit the team this coming season um I, if i was the team I, I would really give him a shot to earn a rotation spot because i do think aside from dylan Cease, he's probably the second highest upside pitcher in the organization right now honestly um in terms of being ready right now and then you know you look at the other side of the thing and there's some interesting young pieces i think fraser ellard's a guy that is super under the radar but as we talked about you know the bullpen is super up for grabs Ellard was really solid in the Arizona Fall League, um, and he's someone that, you know, from watching him last year and then being able to talk to him a little bit, he he could be a real piece in the bullpen. Um, I think he's a, a left-hander, and the Sox, you know, could use the left-hander after trading Bummer. I think there's, there's really an opening in probably about five of the bullpen spots, honestly, um, in terms of a combination of the non-roster guys and the other guys that are on the roster. So I think Ellard's someone who, with a good spring, given his age and his experience in their leagues, could honestly crack the team or, or be up pretty soon. And then on the offensive side, I don't think there's a ton of players uh, within the organization that are going to push for roster spots yet. But of course, it's going to be exciting to see, you know, the Colson Montgomery's, the Edgar Caro, and a lot of the other pieces who, you know, will be up in the near future, probably not quite yet. Um, but there's there's other players to watch there that deserve the chance to be at Major League Camp. Yeah, agreed. There There is there there's so much just uh, apathy for 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 the roster at this point. I mean, there's a, a couple of guys that, you know, that we expect to stick around uh, from previous years. You know, Yohan Mankata, uh, Eloy at, at DH possibly, um, you know, because none of those guys ended up getting traded. And uh, that is what it is. And, you know, we'll see what the uh, NRI guys, you know, I I wouldn't say that there's the, the minor league guys that the White Sox invited to camp. Those guys, some of those guys, obviously, I'm interested in. Um, the other guys, I don't know, you know. Uh, like, am I interested in uh, Brett Phillips or Chucky Robinson? Not particularly. <laughs> you know, I don't really uh, I don't really expect either of them to even be with the organization after spring training, to be honest. I guess I missed the assignment on that question, by the way, talking about the 40-man, huh? Well, I mean, <laughs> roster invites. You know, I th- those guys are you know going to be at spring training as well. Um, and you know the uh, they did add some of those minor league guys as you know non 
forty man roster invitees. So there are some. So um I don't know. Um I, can I interest anyone in Rafael Ortega? Oh. I think there's a I think there's a world Ortega could be a fourth outfielder. That's another guy that, you know, at least stands out to me a little bit. I think, like you said, a lot of the non-roster invites are not all that exciting. But Ortega is someone that I could see. He, he had a stint with the Cubs where he looked like an MLB player for a little while. So I could see him cracking the roster given the situation in the outfield. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I guess probably if you're really looking at things, the most interesting battle out of all these guys that are recent minor league additions Obviously, the addition of Kevin Pillar is going to be an interesting one, uh, but you know when you look at his, you know at his at his stats. I mean, you know we're going back several years now where the guy hasn't put together really, you know, any numbers to speak of per se, and you know the the, the only thing that really jumps out on the page to you about Kevin Pillar is versus left-handed pitching and him being in a platoon spot. And, you know, Danny, when you speak about the, the right field debacle and uh, the fact that they picked up Dom Fletcher from the Diamondbacks, um, you know, possibly that is a, a, a decent pairing for him in, somewhat, in, in a platoon. But, you know, again, you know, health is obviously a concern as well, so... Um, yeah, so anywho, um, sorry, trying to work on this connection stuff over here on this side. Um, so if we are looking at this bullpen battle, if, if you can call it a battle, um, there, they've, you know, today they, they just added two more names to pile on to this whole thing in uh, Dominic Leone and Corey Ebel Kniebel. Um, Kniebel didn't pitch last year, had a uh, capsule tear in his shoulder. Um, you know, I don't – he's – you know, I, I understand that they, that they signed him and that it's, you know, a position that we all see that there's going to be a need in the bullpen. Um, but do you guys see anything coming of this Knievel signing at all? Knievel, Knievel? No, not really. <laughs> Nothing. I mean, n none of these things get, <laughs> you know, get me terribly excited. Uh, again, it's just, I can't, what, what arms can we bring in? You know, does anybody have any background maybe on these arms? Uh, maybe they check in with Bannister and, and cats and I, I like what I've seen or I've heard good things. It's worth, you know, bringing somebody in. You never know uh, a different organization, the change of scenery. We've heard all that kind of stuff before. Um, I, I mean, it happened last off season. I, I feel like that was, you know, a guy like Gregory Santos came in, right? And wow, what what an explosive arm! And it, he ended up being real nails for the Sox. Uh, again, I thought he was going to be traded at the deadline. So, you know, sometimes it's just, hey, this guy's got an arm or he's got something. But it just hasn't worked out in a previous environment. None of those names, though, it, it, nothing's really getting, it, like, jumping off of the page. Like, wow, um, th this has got to be where this guy's going to fit in. You know, I, th there's a little clarity, I would say, over the last – you know, day or so over Kopech and Crochet, in my mind, it definitely seems like Kopech you know, is in that starting rotation, and Crochet has been working through the offseason and building himself up for the starting rotation. But, you know, he's kind of left it up to the organization and, and what have you, where he's going to fit in almost like an Aloy Jimenez, like, I, I want to be out in right field, but I'm willing to do whatever is best for the team. You know, Crochet clearly wants to be a starter. Yeah. The uh, the Chris Getz comments about uh, Crochet possibly being a starter, I talked about it briefly with uh, James on the, uh, the stream last night. And uh, does anybody – of this group think that Garrett Crochet has any shot at being a starter in the major leagues without at least spending 
you know, the majority of a season in the minor leagues. Can't see it. Yeah, I don't know that he's, you know, they can say he's been working all season to get himself stretched out. And I know that, you know, they've been kind of force feeding us this, the the rhetoric, I want to call it, that, uh, you know, Care Crochet is going to be a major league starter for this White Sox team this year. And I just don't see that happening right out of the gate. You know, we're talking about what a guy you, who hasn't have been lose, fully stretched bro. out. Like, like a, a I mean, solid left-handed can... arm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah arm, no, I, I, under, I understand that. But if they say, "Look, we agree," like we agree and we fully support the program that you've put in in the off season. We don't know how long he's been doing this. We don't know how he's built up in the off season. Everything's kind of kept quiet. If they say we like what you've done and you, you're showing it off in spring. I mean, I don't, I just don't understand. Like, why not? Why not this year? Is there a world where you run six man rotation and have him be kind of an opener? I think that's maybe a possibility. Um, I could see a world where, you know, you have him be the six starter and he goes three, four innings in that start as, as the opener to a more of a bullpen game or even a five starter in a five man rotation and just assume he's going to be more of an opener than a full starter. I think that's maybe the way you make it happen, but I just, I almost would rather see him. I don't know. I mean, you, you can go with the route of him in the minor leagues and just let him be a starter, develop as a starter, have him be ready to be a starter next year. Or I think you could also just have him be a bullpen guy. Who's just your multi-inning guy in the pen. And just you get that time, and I, I don't know. I, my, in my opinion, I, I don't really see him being a starter. Um, I'm just not sure I can buy it after the last few seasons. So I almost would rather him just hey, be a multi inning. I, I don't believe it. I don't believe yeah. it either. I'm shocked that we're having this conversation. But like, if he checks all the boxes and it like works for them and they trust, I'm like, well then, go ahead. But I, I'm 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 in denial that this is actually going to happen. It's just we've we've been hearing so much about it that well where there's smoke there might be fire here this this might actually happen yeah i only have one thing i want to add to that uh you know one of the biggest things that and, and ian and i have talked about this you know back in the in the white Sox daily uh days and uh you know we've talked a little bit about it here since coming over to future Sox, but the thing with Garrett Crochet is, is after, you know, his, his Tommy John and he came back, he never got the, the velo back like he was before. You know, he was 101, 102 and just throwing BBs up there and, and just beating guys with you know, pure power. And he comes back from this Tommy John surgery and he's averaging 95, 96 miles an hour on the fastball. And we saw him get touched up quite a bit. And the, the problem is, is his fastball doesn't move at all. He throws it straight as an arrow. He's got... You know, we compare him to Zach Birdie, you know, and what everybody mm-hmm. yeah. expected from Zach Birdie as a closer. And that was Birdie's thing was once the velo kind of dipped just a little bit, there's no movement on the fastball and he gets touched up, you know, against major league pitching or major league hitters, excuse me. And my thing is, is if Garrett Crochet is going to be successful in either role, he's either got to have an uptick in the velocity or he's got to find some movement on the fastball because he's just yeah. not I mean, going to beat anybody with it, a straight as an arrow ball. Is it really that different from Michael Kopech? I mean, if you really think about it, it's at Kopech. Kopech's velo is way down from where it used to be. I don't see him having the stamina to be a full-time starter. And he doesn't have enough movement on his fastball for it to not get it around all the time at the current velocity it's at. I mean, I think it's you're, you're almost in the same position with him. It's, it's different because Kopech has at least been starting the last few years. But uh, the way I see it, I, I don't really get it with either of them. I think it's it's kind of holding on to this like elite prospect like pedigree that they both had where it's like, oh, these guys were supposed to be the guys. So let's just try and make them the guys. When in reality, both of them are probably better as relievers and both of them will probably end up being relievers. At some point, my my thing with Kopech, and we kind of touched on it last week, is the lack of control. There's no way you could put him in right now in the sixth or seventh, uh, maybe even the fifth in, in a jam. Well, from what we've seen, right now, if he changes completely this spring and he's just his control is lights out, and you know the organization has says, you know what, with what we've brought in and what we have to work with. And, and the lack of a bullpen, maybe maybe you should be in the bullpen. 
but I got no faith in him coming in with guys on and because you, you can't figure it out. You know, Danny mentioned you got to face three guys, you know, when you when you come out of the bullpen where as a starter, it's like if you're a little shaky in the first or something and, you know, we've seen this from other guys. OK, then you might be able to find your footing and for the next three, four, maybe into the fifth, because that's the way we, we work these days in MLB. You know, you can be you know, you can settle in he doesn't have that luxury to like try to settle in, you know, out, out of the bullpen, uh, the crochet thing. It's the mentality of like, you're not a thrower anymore. You're a pitcher, man. You are just not going to be able to just go triple digits. You have to learn the craft of pitching. You know, you've got to be able to uh, throw three pitches, you know, with confidence at any point, keep people off balance. You can't just, you know, Matt Thornton, uh, Zach Birdie, whoever you want to talk about that is throwing straight, you're throwing hard, and it gets hit. It can get timed up. So, look, I, I don't even know why the organization would talk about crochet in the starting rotation unless there's been a lot of, like, due diligence already. It's just odd. It's odd to me. It, it reminds me to do a little bit of, like, right field stuff. Remember how much they talked about Colas last offseason? And, like, you know, we were getting pushed Colas by Han, and everyone was like, really? Do you really think he's just going to jump right and be our, our starting right fielder? And, okay, he didn't hurt himself in spring, but he ended up being, you know, your right fielder pretty much, um, not on, uh, you know, opening day. But So, um, yeah. I, the the whole uh, the whole starting pitching thing to me is is kind of weird and, and you know as you alluded to Elijah with the the multi man you know the the six man rotation and stuff like that the only problem that I see with that scenario is that you still have Dylan Cease here if Dylan Cease had been traded you know I could see them going to a six man rotation and giving a guy a start every six days. But when you have Dylan Cease here, that's, I, I can't imagine that Good they're point. going to go to a, a scenario like that when you've got a guy like that on the, on the starting staff. Yeah, it just it just feels like beyond Cease, you've got nine, ten guys who could be starters and none that you feel confident in. So, yeah, Eric Fetty, sure, he's your number two right now going into the season because he signed a $50 million deal. Awesome, cool, he might pitch like he did in Korea he might be like he was with the Nationals so you never know I'm not totally bought in on him I think he's changed a lot and he looks solid but you're in a situation where the majority of the rotation is just total question marks so that's why like part of me is like again I would have traded Cease this offseason and clearly the package hasn't been there because I don't think the team doesn't want to trade him I just think there hasn't been an offer on the table when you look at what the Orioles ended up giving up for Corbin Burns I would have been really upset if that was the package for Dylan Cease so at the end of the day I get keeping him because of the situation but it kind of hinders some some possibilities to a degree like you were just saying with the rotation because you've got a lot of question marks in this rotation and they're gonna have to figure out what the most creative and logical usage is of this pitchers to make a rotation that looks good and to figure out who's part of the rotation moving forward because I'm not sure that anybody in the current starting rotation is a p is pitching for the White Sox in two years from now. That's Nikki. a great point, actually, right at the end there. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Nestrini, right? Nestrini, that's the one guy, but he's not even in yeah, the I don't even probably. know if I see him coming up at all this season, to be honest with you. I'd like to see I don't. I don't feel like he, they, there's any need to rush Nestrini at this point. You know, especially not, with the mm -hmm. with the what yeah. with the what the uh, the offense is going to look like this season, and you know, given the uh, predictions that the White Sox are probably not going to win more than, uh, you know, I may be generous here with saying seventy five games. You it's know, generous. I just don't see a, a, a reason to bring up Nestrini right. You know, but it's I, I, there's no yeah, reason but, to rush him. I know the Sox aren't good, but I think you don't you're not you can't focus on him being brought up or not because of them being good i think you bring him up because he's ready or not and he's 24 years old and has been productive and had really good chase mate rates and stuff in the minor league so i'm not saying you rush him i don't think he'll make the opening roster but i think he's at least a near ready pitcher that you could put in the rotation at some point this season and have someone to watch that you actually think is a piece of the future as opposed to most of these pitchers who are probably just you know one two season options that maybe one hits and is good, you know. 
All yeah. right. Yeah, I could see I could see, I could see Nestrini making making a run. Uh the the only thing that I kind of struggle with here is that like we said there there there's like 10 guys that are vying for five positions if you're going with a five man rotation and you're probably going to do that with Cease. So, you've got Cease and Fetty are are definitely going to be two of the guys. And then after that, then you have to figure out you've got three remaining spots. You've got Kopech You've got, uh, I mean, to a lesser extent, you know, you've got Toussaint, you've got Schultons, you know, you've got like basically just a, a bunch of guys. And uh, like like you said, Nick, like who knows what you're going to get out of Kopech. And, you know, do you, with this offense, when you're going to be throwing guys out there on the mound, you know, do you, you know, We've talked about this several times that if the the White Sox are losing, you know, say three to two, and that's how they're losing games, um, and you know, like you said, Nick, you want to see competent baseball. You want to see them not kicking the ball around. If if that's what you get, and you know, the the pitching performances are are up to par, then great. I don't know. You know, it's just like like you said. Do do we have you know it's a bunch of guys that you don't have confidence in. So well, I, I think that I think then that's what you look at this season perhaps is you go into the season almost in a weird spring training type of mentality of you can compartmentalize, forget the wins losses, you know where 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 is this team looking in twenty twenty five and beyond and how how are the how are the performances that are happening on this ball club. Like how is it helping f- for the future of the White Sox? And if they lose some heartbreakers, but hey, there are some arms here that are really performing well that we know are going to be around. I'm okay with it. You know, if 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 things are lacking somewhere else, but you know, we're getting some offense from guys or defense from guys that there's a future. You know, at 35th and Shields. I, that's how it's going to have to be. That that was like 2017, 2018, 2019, right? It's don't look. It's the game within the game within the game. You know, just don't look at the you know wins loss. Like you got to really be paying attention in in certain situations. That I hate to say it is what 2025 is going to be like. Yeah, and that's and that's why I, as a prospect falling person, and because of that logic that you're describing there, Nick. Bring guys up. If now I'm not saying rush guys, but if people are ready and they're at an appropriate age where they've shown enough that they need to show in Birmingham and Charlotte, go for it, right? A Jonathan Cannon, for example, another guy at Major League Camp, right? Doesn't have a super projectable ceiling, but his floor is there. He throws five pitches. He mixes and matches. He has good location. If he's getting results in AAA midseason, sure, give him a rotation spot. I'd way rather see that than continue to watch – Toussaint and Schultons and you know all these other guys who I don't know are anything right so this is the year of growth and we've I've talked about this many times with like everybody I know in the White Sox world like this is about figuring out who's part of a 2025 roster so when it comes down to it figure out who looks the best out of camp figure out some guys you can identify as players you can flip at the deadline if they're performing in terms of those veteran non-roster guys right and then Bring guys up when they're ready and bring guys up maybe a little bit aggressively, right? I think the days of hesitating on prospects are kind of over. I mean, look around Major League Baseball right now. You've got 21, 22-year-old guys that if they're showing that they're ready are coming up, yeah, they might take a bit to adjust. I mean, Jordan Walker last year is a good example of someone who got a ton of hype, came up, was not ready, needed a little more time. Second half of the season looks like a future, you know, middle of the lineup guy for the Cardinals going forward. There's players like that in the White Sox system who, yeah, it might be a little hard at first, but the second half of the season should be focused on those players. All right, so here's here's a question, and this is something that I, I know that I've talked to Danny about um, a couple of times. So they've been saying that they don't want to rebuild, they want to retool. And <laughs> we all know, looking at this roster, that this is this – is, I, I can't necessarily say it's 100% a teardown, but when you've got a bunch of guys that you signed and are only on one-year deals for the most part, even, I mean, like, Yohan Mankata, you're not going to keep him past this year unless he has MVP-type numbers. 
uh, Eloy, same deal. Um, you know, but you've got all these guys that you traded with to the Braves, you know, in getting, uh, you know, uh, Nicky Lopez and, you know, you got Paul DeJong. I mean, you got like all these guys that are just here for one year. And if you know that this is going to be a lost year, I personally, I've heard a lot of people say that they're going to, that they're going to riot if it's a full teardown type rebuild. But realistically last year we saw one of the worst seasons in baseball all time when it comes to offense and when it comes to I mean we you know we're not talking Cleveland spider levels here of win loss record but you know it was it was very bad so what is the point in getting these guys that are all for the most part all below replacement level in Major League Baseball and forcing them all onto the field in order to, I don't know, maybe get an extra couple of ground balls and commit a couple less errors. I'm just going to open that up to you guys and let you guys run with that. Yeah, I want to hear from Nick on this one. This is this is Nick's specialty here. <laughs> I mean, I just, you know, in terms of the <laughs> verbiage and retool – reorganization i don't understand why you why we're so afraid and it's not us it's the organization just to come out and say it say rebuild and you know i i think the fans are forgiving we're forgiving i think culture maybe i mean if you just come out and say it failed this is a rebuild now there are variations of rebuild we can define the word rebuild but the fact of the matter is whatever was wor- whatever was happening before did not work okay i'm not you know we all watched it we all witnessed it and we've got to reimagine and that means it's going to have to be a rebuild uh, from culture from personality to how we play baseball so you know look the draft is not going to help you if you tank you know you're not going to be you're not you're not going to be in that that number one spot, that top five spot. So it frustrates me that they've kept the payroll low. You know, it's and, and everyone talks about, well, they're going to spring for the off season, you know, next year. Maybe, you know, maybe they won't. You know, we've been down this road before. Um, don't tell me in August and in September that you're going to be a competitive ball club. And that because you're in the AL Central, you don't have to do much. Are you pandering to the ticket holders? Are you pandering to the fans who are not stupid? If you've been paying attention, you can see right through all of this. Okay. I just want a little bit more honesty because, hey, Getz is, he's provided some depth. I, I can't lay all of Han's faults at all at his feet. Um, the, for me, I, I, I can't make a real judgment on Getz. He hasn't done anything like gutsy. So it's been a disappointing off season uh, all around. I mean, the athletic came out with the grades. I think it was like a D, which they earned it. And probably they could even gone lower. So I, I get really bent out of shape when we have to, we have to define what's going on and define rebuild. Like just have some guts to just, it is a rebuild. You know, this is what's happening with this organization. Trust me, get behind me. We're going to change it. Be here when we do. Uh, I don't know. Should I be working for the marketing department over there? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, and, and before anybody else really says anything on the subject, I just want to add one question to uh, kind of piggyback on, uh, you know, what Ian threw out on the table there. And, you know, he says that uh, all these folks are going to riot if, uh, you know, it's a full teardown. And my question is, is how is it not at this point? You know, like you're saying, it if Yoan doesn't have an MVP type season or if Eloy doesn't have a similar type of season uh, and then, you know, they've been shopping Dylan Cease all off season, whether or not the package has been there. How is that? How are we not in full teardown mode? How, how you know, and, and how are you writing writing already? 
I mean, it's like if you're <laughs> right. not fuming mad over what has gone on over the last couple of years and the just complete and utter collapse and failure and mismanagement and, and how they almost malpractice. I mean, organizational malpractice. If you're not fuming, I'm sorry, but getting rid of Dylan Cease and, and even shopping Luis Robert Jr. around, are we, is he ever going to see a new stadium? You know, yeah. if they go to the South Loop, I mean, that's, that's another question, but I, I'm sorry, again, define a full teardown that are you getting rid of everybody that was on the Sox? Are you getting rid of Aloy, Mancata, uh, Kopech, Cease, just completely taking care of anything that was in the Han, you know, world? Is, is that a full teardown? It, to me, I mean, a rebuild is a rebuild you're having to start all over again and that's what they're doing i uh i think it's interesting i agree with nick uh to an extent because it is a rebuild it, that's the reality it's a rebuild but i also maybe this is me being just falsely optimistic to a degree but i i kind of am sick of this narrative of like everybody just being angry all the time about the organization and i get it right like it is not it, it like they've made some really bad decisions and the organization has totally screwed up what should have been an era of competing that's the reality okay let's accept that and let's focus on what we have because the thing the offseason goal this year while it hasn't been a good offseason it hasn't been exciting the offseason has been about whether they admit it or not it doesn't matter what they admit the offseason has been about, let's see what our next generation looks like and try to develop a culture of fundamental baseball. I know that's just a trigger word. People don't like it, whatever. And Here's let's focus word. on this next generation. <laughs> I know. I know. Whatever. And let's focus on this next generation and see what we have over the next year to start to prepare for the next era in 2025. And I, it, that's not – I know that's not exciting. I get it. But there's just no reason You're, to continue yeah, Elijah, you are right. Upset. You are, you are right on that, and 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 if I I think we would all as fans would have stomached that if it was said in August or September by Gats, right? Just came out and just said it. Like let's like let's take care of this right now. And I'm just gonna tell you, you know, he's big on the whole like I don't like our team, and and there you know, it Getz, is. You know, there, there's been articles recently about like how Gats has been very upfront about uh, pitching uh, off a. Uh, Pitching free agents didn't want to come to the organization because, you know, the, the defense was suspect. He, he's being open and candid about a lot of things. I wish, to your point, Elijah, he would have said that from the get-go. It, it, would, have, it would have alleviated a, a lot of this, uh, eliminated it, really. I just think you don't need to hide behind the curtain of a team that hasn't succeeded, right? Like, that. you're right. There's team failed the rebuild that we all expected from 2016 when we traded chris sale all the way up until 2021 when you made the playoffs and you got smoked by the astros that rebuild did not work like that is the straight facts of this that core that came from the quintana trade and the sale trade and the eaton trade and all those players right that didn't work that's the reality of chicago white Sox baseball is you spent five years on a rebuild that failed so right now right pivot there were some good trades at the deadline. There were some there were some good prospects that have been drafted. The last two draft classes looked a lot better than the few years prior to that. Mike Shirley has done a really good job developing the farm system in a way that we haven't seen in the past. The past was getting farm system players by trading assets and by acquiring prospects. Right now, you're seeing a lot of homegrown talent that's doing well in the White Sox system in addition to players that were brought in last offseason and last deadline. So just embrace that. Just go with it. Say, you know... This is the era of White Sox baseball. We're focused on 2025. This is a year to try and figure out who you have for the future. We're going to continue to bring up prospects. We're going to watch all these players in Kannapolis and Winston and Birmingham make their way up to the big leagues in the next year or two. And that's our next rebuild, and that's our next era of White Sox baseball because that is the reality whether they want to admit it or not. So what do you say then? Uh, you know, I 100% agree that this is the year, especially after last year, This and, and knowing that it failed, and you've got these expiring contracts coming in next year. So my issue with this whole thing is that when you look at all of those circumstances, why then bring in a bunch of guys on one-year contracts to, quote-unquote, reestablish the culture when you've got a bunch of guys that are like, pretty much at that point right now where they need to be able to go up to the major leagues and 
get some consistent at-bats to see if there is anything there. You need to get some pitchers up there that are not just placeholders and are guys that are pushing that line, like a Nestrini, like a Jared Schuster, hopefully, uh, as was mentioned by uh, Wolf uh, Larson earlier, uh, it would be nice to see Schuster get a, get an opportunity out there. And Bannister and Katz have found some issues with his delivery that were causing him issues last year. I mean, we're talking about a guy who was Atlanta's number one prospect. This is a kind of this is the kind of guy that should be getting meaningful innings for the White Sox if yeah, they can number one prospect figure out, in a stacked system. Well, I mean, so, in a stacked pitching system, anyway. Right. You, you saw what, what kind of happened in a small sample size with Grafol and uh, Corey Lee and Oscar Colas. I don't think he handled those situations very well. And, and I'm wondering if Chris gets in conversations with Pedro Grafol said, well, what kind of team do you want? Do you want veterans on this team? You know, do you want guys that, you know, you've got a track record with or – are those the type of guys that you want to be around or do you want to have a lot of youth this year? I, I'm just trying to, I don't know. I, I the question that you had um, and I, I really don't know. And, and these are the games that you play. And, and I'm wondering if Pedro said, you know what? I want some veterans. I want some guys that, and, and, and that's the route that it went. I don't know. Yeah. So I, what? So he wants he wants a bunch of veterans so they can run his clubhouse for him, like he was hoping was going to happen last year. <laughs> so why, so why about... is he still here? Is is my point? I don't think it's as much about that though. As I'm not sure it's just about having veterans to be in the clubhouse. I think what you have to do as a rebuilding team, to an extent, is not all the young players are ready, right? So Nestrini, I think, is a guy who should get run soon. But there is a lot of spots on the roster with players who still need some time in the minor leagues, right? Even a Colson Montgomery, right? Like, well, let's take Colson for an example, right? Like, Especially, he's not ready to be the big yeah. league shortstop. No. He's incredibly talented. He There's no reason to rush him. So you're in a position where not only do you have to wait for him, but in the meantime, you have the opportunity to test some guys out and flip them if you need to. And if they perform well and they're a veteran, like take a Kenyon Middleton, for example, last year, right? That was a non-roster invite, made the bullpen, was really solid, returned to Juan Carrello, who is a top 30 prospect for me right now within the system. Sure, Juan Carrello might not be anything, but if you're waiting on those prospects, why not take some veterans in that you could maybe flip for something if they play well in the first half of the season? That is that is fair. Uh, I just, um, the, the thing yeah, that I to, wonder it, about it, is cramming the entire roster filled with a roster full of of players of that ilk, you know. So I just want to run through uh, the NRI guys for the bullpen that uh, we were speaking of, of uh, all these guys, to get away from uh, all of the uh, the yelling and the anger and uh, <laughs> all of that stuff for a little bit. Uh, so we got Justin Anderson, uh, mostly minor league stuff. Uh, he was in the Royals org in 23, which is uh, is You good. don't say. Yeah, uh, but he did have a 1.47 whip across three levels, which is not great. Uh, but he was, uh, you know, that was over three levels, and most of that was in rookie ball last year. He had a around a one whip in double A AA and triple A last year, so he might be somebody that might be able to, uh, you know, at least push for uh, significant time, at least in Charlotte, if nothing else. Um, we have Joe Barlow, who went the Alex Spees route of being claimed off the Rangers roster by the Royals. Stop me if you've heard this before. Um, 79 games with uh, Texas since 21, and uh, he's put up a 1.07 whip with a 3.05 ERA. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that I'm starting to see here as, as kind of a pattern is that he is 61% slider and 36% fastball. Jake Cousins, uh, three seasons with the Brewers. Last year, uh, okay, not great. Uh, 1.39 whip with a 3.08 ERA uh, for his career. Last year, uh, 2.14 whip. So, again, you know, Ooh. one of those guys who last year uh, statistically had his worst uh, year of his career. But he's 54% slider and 29% sinker. Um Chad Cool, um, worst year of career last year. Um, he is a spot starter, possibly uh, a long guy. Um, 
but uh, last year mitigating factors he had uh, what was it uh, right f- uh, his right foot his push his push off foot it was uh, meta metatarsalgia, which is just a fancy way of saying that he had uh, you know the balls of his feet there was something that was sore on his push off foot. So obviously that's not going to uh, lend itself to uh, pitching very well. Um, but he is 43% slider, 35% sinker. He throws a knuckle curveball. Um, you got Jesse Chavez, who I have to think is pretty much a shoe in for the White Sox bullpen. I mean, is there any way that this guy doesn't make the club? Uh, last year, uh, he was a 1.10 whip with a 1.56 ERA for the Braves in 36 games. Um, now he's uh, in 144 batters faced last year, um, 26 hits and 12 walks. Not too shabby. Uh, he throws cutter most of the time, and then he throws a sinker. Uh, so it's 50% cutter, 30% sinker. And yeah, uh, probably a uh, taking a, a Sergio Santos type role with the uh, White Sox this year. I'm imagining. Definitely see that. And then you've got Dominic Leone, who was picked up today. Uh, Giants Bannister connection. Uh, the best year of his career was in 2021 with the Giants under Bannister. Um, I think he had like a, yeah, he had a 1.10 whip that year and a 1.51 ERA. Um, he's kind of uh, splits up evenly between his fastball, his cutter, and his slider uh, by his pitch metrics. Um, you know, I don't know if Bannister is going to go in and start tweaking any of that. We know that that's one of the things that he's really good at is trying to find one spot where, you know, he finds that somebody's going to excel or the situational, you know, pitching thing. Then you got, you know, Knable. We talked about him earlier. Wasn't even in baseball last year, so that's a – I don't even see that happening. And then you've got Jake Woodford. Uh, he's been down with the Cardinals, and he's actually not been too terrible. And he's uh, – the one thing about him, 85th percentile in ground ball percentage. So he does throw a lot of ground balls, uh, kind of fits with – gets his, you know, defensive manifesto, uh, 50% sinker, 25 uh, – uh, tw- what, uh, 22% uh, sweeper, and uh, he's got a seven-pitch arsenal. So um, a lot of – you know, as – as Bannister said, things that he wanted to see was a lot of different looks. So we're seeing that. So the issue is, uh, are any of them going to be good enough to uh, to make it? Your thoughts? <laughs> Elijah, you want to take this one? Yeah, I'll, I'll get going here with the pen. I mean, I, like I said earlier with like a Middleton last <clears throat> year, I, I do think this is an area where you can just kind of see – who has the most upside, who could actually be solid, and then who could we flip at the deadline for a prospect and a throw-in and just see what happens. Because the reality is none of these, very few of these players really have a chance to be meaningful for the future at all. Um, I think, like you said, Chavez, even at his really, really old age, I believe, um, you know, will be in the pen. I think Leon will have a decent shot. I I think there's a handful of guys that are fun. Um, I mean, fun marginally, I guess. Um, and could make the roster. Um, and ultimately, I think most of these players are just, you give them a shot. If they're solid, you flip them at the deadline. You maybe re-sign one or two guys to a one-year deal, whatever. But I also want to see some of the younger guys getting a shot. I think an Alex Sp- Spees should get a shot. I think by the end of the season, I think there's a good chance Jordan Leisure is the closer for the White Sox, to be honest. I think Leisure is a guy who I really want to see. Prelander Baroa just acquired, you know, is from the Mariners. Baroa is another guy that should, despite the command, and problems should get a shot at some point so it really comes down to like who do you want to start the season with on roster a few of these guys you figure out which ones look the most tradable basically um and you, you bring those guys into the season and then as you either cut guys or trade guys depending on how they perform then you bring up the baroa and the leisure and the spees and even the fraser Ellard, like i mentioned earlier because there is some fun young arms in in the system for the bullpen potentially so it really just comes down to which veterans you see being at least decent to the extent where they can be competent in the bullpen and then they can get either if they're if, if they struggle immediately you can let them go bring up a young guy or if they're solid you can flip them at the deadline for a young product. yeah uh i think you pretty much hit it on the head uh oh i'm sorry go ahead no Nick. you're good run with it um 
look, I, I mean, I, w when it comes to battles in spring training, you, the margin of error is just not there. You, you have to throw strikes. I mean, I mean, I, I, for guys that have con do not are not working through control issues, their mechanics are clean, and I, I, it goes to what Bannister and Cass are essentially trying to do. So, I like guys that can keep hitters off balance. I like guys with a lot of movement. You know that you're bringing out of the pen that have life to their stuff. Uh, that obviously have pop they, and they've got a strong arm. Uh, they can throw multiple pitches in 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 those multiple situations because you know you come in in a pinch when you got guys on, you got to have confidence. And you know if it's a ground ball pitcher, that's great. Have that arsenal. So I think it's just what kind of collection they're trying to put together in the bullpen. Um, but for me, during these times. Man, it's simple stuff. It's can you throw strikes and can you throw consistently? Uh, and I hopefully that gets figured out. And you know, and, and they've got enough warm bodies where you know they can cobble something together. Danny, yeah, I really don't don't have much to add, honestly. Um, you know, the one thing that I've said over and over again. And, and it's not news to anybody who's listening to any of our shows and we talk about the bullpen is, you know, sure, we've got a, a handful of guys that the White Sox have kind of picked up as veteran star, or I'm sorry, veteran bullpen arms here recently. But the one place, you know, where people complain about development in the White Sox system, uh, the one place you don't have to really worry about any type of complaints there is usually bullpen arms. Uh, I would like just to see some of these younger guys that have been homegrown talent make their way up and get an opportunity uh to uh you know at least get it doesn't necessarily have to be right away you know obviously there's going to be uh, a handful of guys that are going to go down throughout the season uh you know i just want to see next man up you know like we've kind of been the theme of the show today is you know giving some guys some opportunities and i hope that the white Sox don't waste those opportunities on these veterans that have been around baseball for a while just because they're veterans. I want to see some of those younger arms get an opportunity, and that's one of the places the White Sox have been able to excel. Yeah, I I agree. You know, that, uh, the bullpen's generally one of the places where they, they generally do okay by themselves without picking anything up, and, you know, they, they picked up a, a couple of guys that could possibly be quality arms, and, you know, we know that Bannister is – you know, one of those guys who likes to turn around guys' careers. So, uh, you know, maybe we see some of that magic this season. Uh, as far as the – Ultimately, uh, I think – Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say I think they learned their lesson with, you know, spending money on Joe Kelly and Kendall Graveman instead of getting a right fielder two years ago. <laughs> so it's like the bullpen, the bullpen is something where you, you don't need to spend money. You can find some diamonds in the rough. You can develop some solid guys in the in the farm system, and it will be fine. It might not be the best bullpen. It's probably going to be a pretty bad bullpen, but you'll find some pieces. You'll figure it out. You'll give Jordan Leisure a shot. You'll give Baroa a shot, and it'll it'll work itself out ultimately. And it really – it may not even make that much of a difference which one of those non-roster guys you end up deciding will make the bullpen. Yeah. Damn it, Elijah, I just put a cigarette out, and you had to go and throw in guys like Kelly. Anywho, I think that was a I think that was a La Russa mentality, right? I mean, the master bullpen, uh, like that was his thing, uh, how he was able to work a bullpen, and and I I have a feeling he said, look, this is the, this is what I want, um, and they just let and they did it, it's crazy. Yeah, I think the uh, the formula of spending thirty percent of your payroll on the bullpen has, uh, you know. While I didn't mind some of the pickups, uh, it seems like uh, maybe the ratio was a, a hair off on that. Um, it would be nice to see them, uh, you know, spend some of that money on positional players. Uh, so the minor league guys that the White Sox invited: uh, Adam Hackenberg, Carlos Perez, Edgar Caro, uh, Tim Elko, Colson Montgomery, and Zach Remillard on the positional side. And then for the pitching side, you got Kai Bush, Jonathan Cannon. Frazier Ellard, uh, Jordan Leisure, Nick Nestrini, Edgar Navarro, uh, Padilla, forgetting the first name because he pitched so well last year for the White Sox uh, to a two-point-something 
whip last year. Nicholas Padilla, and then Lane Ramsey, who we also saw uh, of six foot nine fame. Um, so, uh, who are you guys excited to see get a shot in the minor? You know, from the from these minor league guys. For me personally, uh, I'm excited to see uh, Elko get some run and see what he can do. Um, you know, in, even if it is just in uh, spring training in Arizona where the ball flies, I'm all for seeing him hit a 500-foot home run. Uh, but I will uh, kick it to you guys. Uh, Elijah, who are you uh, Who are you looking for? Yeah, I touched on this earlier. Um, I don't need to go too deep into it. Nestrini and Ellard are the two guys in terms of pitching and leisure as well, like I just mentioned. I think all three of those guys will be major league pieces pretty soon. So just seeing how they can handle some, you know, advanced hitters and spring training is going to be good. I think those three especially are really going to be pieces for the major league team pretty soon. Um, I think, you know, there's some other exciting pieces here and there. Obviously, Colson will be fun to watch. I think seeing how Caro kind of works with some of the, the major league level pitchers is going to be exciting because a big focus for him, um, when I talked to him in Birmingham and I got to see him work a lot, a lot of his focus right now is on his receiving and how he receives and how he kind of works with pitchers because he is a, he's a bat first guy. He's been, he's kind of, his defense has gotten better and better. So I'm just excited to see him work with some of the big league talent in terms of the pitchers and see how he's kind of able to work behind the plate with them because I do think he is the future of the catching position. And I think that from what I saw, a lot of pitchers really liked and working with him and trusted him so i'm curious to see how that carries over with some of the major league pitchers um and then beyond that i think you know just continuing to see what we get from colson right i mean i think that's the biggest thing everybody's gonna be watching is is where's colson at in his development because he's not big league ready right now but it's kind of the question of is he big league ready later this season or is it still not going to be till 2025 so i think that's kind of what you're going to be looking for in spring training with him is like does he look like there's a world where he's a big league player this year, or is he still a full year away? I can kind of see it going either way right now, honestly. I think the team's going to want to call him up later in the season, but I don't want them rushing him, in which case, you know, if you see him struggle in spring training and you can see his swing not quite where it needs to be, there's a chance, you know, he ends up being 2025 instead of late 24. Nick? I mean, this is your power alley, guys. Um, you, I, I trust actually what what you you guys spend a lot of time looking at these prospects and, and James Fox and so many others here for future Sox. Um, I I am a pitcher guy. I, I do like to pay attention to arms and especially future arms. But when we talk, um, you know, we've talked a lot about like Mancada is. This is probably going to be it for Mancada and. Um, maybe you could say that about Jimenez. I, I, so in your mind, you know, and maybe Danny, you want to take this and then we could, we could look at it a little bit. Like, is there the future third baseman right now um, in this organization that needs to be looked at? Like, like, like where, where are we looking to fill some of these spots uh, moving forward after this season? Well, so, you know, it, it's been talked about a little bit if, uh, you know, Colson's going to stick at shortstop and then obviously you know brian ramos is a name that's been tossed around a lot the last couple of years as well too i think between those two guys the future uh third baseman is somewhere in the system i don't think it's going to be somebody that they're going to at least not in the next couple of seasons go out and start looking for i think they're going to give one of these two kids an opportunity to come up and prove themselves and like you know elijah said earlier in the show tonight even if it doesn't go well right away uh, a lot of these guys have the makeup and, and the, uh, you know, the, the ceiling that uh, is going to allow them to at least afford them some time to, uh, you know, get an opportunity that's not too short, which, uh, you know, has kind of happened over the years with some of these White Sox prospects that have come up. You know, they give them a shot. They get, you know, Ian and I have talked about this on shows past where guys come up and they, they go through that slump after about 85 to 100 at-bats or so. And then it takes another 85 to 100 at bats to kind of, you know, make the adjustment that the rest of the league has made on them. So, you know, when he, when we talk about third baseman, I think those two guys are going to get a full opportunity to at least play the position yeah. uh, at the major league level at some point. I, you know, and it, as far as like pitching arms, you know, there are some there are some interesting names in the system. You know, Taylor's a guy that that, that doesn't I think get talked about a lot. Uh, but you know he's not ready 
at the moment. We won't probably won't hear from him uh, anytime soon. But you know, there's a wealth of talent. Like Elijah again pointed out earlier in the show in these last couple of uh, draft classes, that uh, you know, yeah, Ellie De La Cruz. <laughs> that's kind of funny, uh, it, but that's exactly the type of of uh, opportunity that some of these guys should be given. The Ellie, De La, it, you know, Ellie kind of came up and and did his thing almost immediately, though, right? I mean, the guy just looked like a seasoned veteran and uh you know there were people giving them mvp chance you know right out the gate so uh i'm hoping for that kind of thing from colson i'm hoping he can clean up his defense a little bit but you know the bat plays for sure going, bat definitely going plays. back a little bit yeah, yeah. going back a little i bit saw on, i saw that look there, elijah I, I saw the look yeah let's let's hear it <laughs> no i uh I am pretty confident that Brian Ramos and Colson Montgomery will be the left side of the infield for a, a substantive while. Um, I, I can say that with some confidence there. I don't think Colson's moving. I think he's going to continue getting better at shortstop. I think there's not that elite defensive shortstop upside with him, but the arm is there. His reaction times are getting better. He's just got to continue to clean up his footwork a little bit, being a bigger guy. I think the footwork is something he's putting a lot of time into, and he's he looks more and more rangy every season that I watch him. Um, and I think Ramos has become not only a solid third baseman, but a good third baseman. I think there was talk about Ramos being, you know, moved over to second base potentially, or even having to play first base in the future a year or two ago. Um, I, I think Ramos is one of the more well-rounded players in the system right now. And it's really just going to come down to how much he can hit and how much he can get hit for contact, not just power. He's got the power in the tank. He's got the arm strength for sure to play third base and his movement at third base has gotten a lot better. I think from what I've seen from him, he's gone in the last two years from a below average third baseman to somebody who grades out as a slightly above average third baseman defensively. So I, I really do think that Brian Ramos is the guy at third base come 2025. And I think this year is just going to be the year for him to sit back and do the best he can to develop in Birmingham and Charlotte. And there's a chance he's up at the end of the season, really. But I think going into 2025, there will be pretty much no questions about those two starting at shortstop and third base, respectively. Yeah, yeah, that, that's great to hear. Yeah, I've, I've heard Ramos. And I, for me, who I, I obviously I pay way more attention to what's happening at the big league level. Uh, in spring training, I do like to look at the future. Like, well, what, you know, what are we looking at? Because this person or this person or this person, this is it for them. You know, they're, they're going to be gone. And who's the next man up? So um, this is the time to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Now, uh, second base, on the other hand, I have no idea who will be playing there come 2025 <laughs> and i cannot make any guarantees about any of the prospects in the system filling in a second base i i really don't feel confident all that much about anybody within the system um, at that spot so i think second base is going to be somewhere that we're going to continue to just try things out and see what sticks really yeah I, as far as second base goes you know i i would like to think that popeye is going to be a guy that could take that spot uh the the only issue you know the only worry with him is you know whether he is too aggressive and the plate approach doesn't work defensively. I know he can hack second base. The guy plays a great second base. It's and the power, you know, with as bad as is nice as well. Just the, the issue is, you know, are we going to be able to hold a, a decent, you know, bat to ball so he can manage to stick there and that, that I, you're not going to find that out until, you know, you give him some at bats up there or he proves in triple a that he can't hack it. Right. I think, so I think there's mean, a chance. So there's a chance he clicks. Yeah, and there's also a chance that he – I do see his profile kind of fitting into the mold of a of a defense speed fourth infielder type of role. Um, I, I, I can see it working at second base, but I also can see him just never quite hitting enough to be an everyday player and being someone that can run a lot and can, can play good defense at second and short and can run into some home runs here and there, but ultimately ends up being kind of that infield utility bench piece. Um, I, I – don't mind that. That's not a bad player to have, right? That's that's somebody who could be useful on a major league roster. But to figure out which version of that or what he is at all, you need to give him some at bats. And he's he's old enough. He's been in the minor leagues enough. He's proven enough. So I think come you know mid season, it's it's at least worth giving him a shot. Um, but I do kind of see his profile potentially fitting into more of that bench infielder role. Yeah. No. I mean that's like I said. There's there's no way to tell until he's getting some more at bats, you know, I, the one thing that he's, you know, he is very good at hitting, you know, the bat to ball is good, 
Uh, just I, I'm wondering if, you know, the approach, approach. of being too, you know, it, it's going to create outs by being too aggressive. And, you know, who knows? Not something you can really see, not to harp on the prospect side of stuff too much, because I know that's not what we're here for, but that's something you can really see throughout the whole system, um, honestly. I mean, there's there's a lot of hitters right now in the White Sox system who the results are good, they can hit the ball really hard, and they have that ability and that bat speed, but they don't have a matured approach enough to be able to know when to pick and choose their moments. I mean, you look at a guy like Tim Elko, who, yes, the numbers are great. He had a lot of home runs. His Even his you know, batting average, his on-base percentage was high because he got on base a lot. Elko struck out at a 37% clip last year. That's just not going to cut it as you continue to rise up to the system and rise up to higher levels of the minor leagues, right? And that's that's the same for a lot of other guys, and that doesn't mean they're bad hitters, but there is a theme with a lot of these White Sox hitters, especially the power guys in the minor leagues, where they don't have the patience to really tap into everything they could be. So I think that's going to be an emphasis for a lot of these players, and it's just going to be something that we need to continue seeing, those improvements, and whichever prospects can improve in that area are going to be the ones that end up becoming big league pieces for a, in a lot of cases. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Ian, can yeah. we uh, can we address these last couple of comments? Yeah, in the I'm chat bringing, here I'm, real Yeah, quick? I wanted to wait until he was done first. No, no, I know. Right. I just right. I wasn't sure if you wanted to move on to something else because I think both. No, of these I think it's I, are, I think uh, it's a it's a this is uh you know good stuff is you know who do you guys think makes opening day roth- roster as the fifth infield Sosa Popeye Shoemaker somebody else? Um, why don't you go ahead and start with that, Elijah? Because I'm assuming that it's probably going to be a minor league guy, but you know. Let's hear what you have to say about it. Yeah, that could go anyway, to be honest. I think that's really up for grabs. I don't think it's Popeye off the bat, just because I think he showed a little bit of struggle at the end of the season last year in uh, Birmingham and then Charlotte, where I think they're going to want to have him in the minors <laughs> a little bit longer. Um, Sosa seems like the most you know, experienced pick, just because he did have that taste last year, even though he didn't do great. So I think maybe you open the season with Sosa and you see what he has. I don't mind Shoemake. Um, from what I've seen, I haven't watched him nearly as much as these other guys, obviously, because they just acquired him this offseason. Um, but I know he's got really good defensive ratings for the most part um, and someone who hasn't kind of he hasn't really gotten the chance yet because of the Braves being way more loaded than the White Sox are in the infield. Um, so I wouldn't mind seeing Shoemake. I, I think realistically, it's probably Sosa to start. And if he continues to do what he did at the end of last season, then you flip over to a Shoemaker or a Popeye pretty soon. Yep. Yeah, I'll agree with that. I, You know, I. I've always I've been a big fan of Lenin pretty much since uh you know they brought him in. It feels like he's been part of the White Sox organization for like a century at this point and he's you know he's still pretty young cuz he came up so early. Uh well, actually he came into the system early I should say. But uh I'm kind of hoping that maybe you know he's got the mental mindset now that another off season after you know getting up to MLB speed last year sometimes that's all you need is a reset as a young guy. And I'm, I'm kind of hoping that uh, we see the Lenin Sosa that we've seen, uh, it, you know, it really good Lenin Sosa at times in, in the minor league system. So uh, I, I agree with Elijah on that. I think that uh, he should probably be the guy to start the season. Although again, I'm also a pretty big fan of Popeye as well. So uh, I don't know, man, it, it is kind of going to be a toss up. You know, it might be one of those things where, we talk about how positional battles don't really mean a whole lot in spring training. When you look at a roster, most of the time, because you can kind of break down just by, you know, you don't have to be a genius. You can break down who's pretty much going to be the guy, you know, when, uh, when you look at a roster, but we're looking at a fourth infielder or, you know, uh, you know, a bench guys, these are going to be the places that maybe where we're going to see those positional battles kind of shake out in spring training and who really impresses. So, you know, all of that stuff's kind of up in the air and uh, will probably solve itself here in the next few weeks. Uh, I'm just going to say one thing and then kick it over to Nick. Um, one thing that I will say is one thing that is of great interest to me is seeing Jose Rodriguez actually being healthy at the start of this season for once. That's That's going to be a huge thing for me because him starting off with uh, pretty nasty injuries for, you know, two seasons in a row, um, I feel like that impacted his start for the last couple of years. And, that, you know, as you look as the, the season goes on, I felt like, you know, the numbers started creeping up and up and up, you know, about a month and a half, two months into the season. So I'm looking forward to seeing if he can jump out to a quick start 
instead of, you know, kind of slowly ramping it up over a month and a half or so. Go ahead, Nick. <laughs> Nobody mentioned Danny Mendick. Um, mm. I'm really surprised by that. Um, I, I assumed, honestly, I kind of assumed going into spring training that it was like Lenin Sosa's to lose. Like they're going to kind of just start there then he could lose the battle. Like he could just, he looks miserable at the plate, like no discipline once again. It, it just, he's not, he just hasn't improved. So th that's just my take on that. But th this is where Hanser Alberto, like he came out of nowhere <laughs> last year. And, and it's like Hanser Alberto won the job and Lurie Garcia was kicked to the curb. I mean, these are the strange things that happen in, in spring training. And then look at what happened to Hanser Alberto. You know, he was the king of the Cactus League, and it was uh, short-lived. So something to watch for. I, you know, I, I hope it's a guy like a Sosa or Rodriguez that has been around the system and just finally, like, it, it unlocks for them. And, and we get to see all the all the stuff that we were not not just promised but that we know is in there and it's just been untapped yeah. there's yeah. a world where where either of those guys could at least be something and i think that you're exactly right it would be nice to see one of those two especially take that leap forward and show like they are a major league piece whether it's a major league piece in a utility form or eventually this main second baseman for the season because that they they will have the chance to earn that spot so it would be really cool to see either of those guys take a next next step forward um, but I think, like you said, I, I don't think you're wrong on that assessment at all that it is Sosa's job to lose right now because he had the time to be up last year and make adjustments based on that this offseason. You know, the only thing that sucks for both of these guys is they are typically guys that uh, need those consistent at-bats, and coming off the bench is going to kind of hurt both of them, I think. Let's see. That's a big part of it, Danny. I mean, that's a great point. That, that's a mindset, isn't it? It's like just a... The ability to do that is is not easy and yeah i mean when you're sitting around cold and, and you can't get into a groove both of those guys uh they need it you're gonna go from probably getting a lot of you're gonna get some consistent at bats in arizona right because you're you're the one that needs to really prove something and then you're gonna go to playing sporadically uh that's that is a that is a great point any of you guys got something uh, that you've got uh, burning on your uh, your on your mind that you need to talk about? No. Gavin Sheets make the roster. I personally, I'm gonna say no. Um, I know that uh, you know he's been the guy who's come up with all the. Uh, you know, catchphrases and uh, interviews where, you know, all sorts of uh, motivational posters are being made. Um, but I just don't think that the uh, that the skill level's there. And I don't feel like he is I, – I don't feel like the White Sox roster is at a point where it can support keeping a guy like that on the roster. So that's, that's my opinion. <laughs> no, I think he's next man up when uh, Andrew Vaughn's back locks up on him. Hey, don't bring that negativity in, into this conversation, Danny. Yeah, we're uh, positive Andrew Vaughn, today, Danny. Been, I'm, he played hey, through hey, the pain last year. I'm not knocking the guy at all. Hey, Andrew up, Vaughn is going to have he's going to have such a decent year. It's going to be ridiculous. How decent? I hope he does. <laughs> I hope he's he going to be decent. so average. You'll I'll see. Decent. It's going to be it's going to be an amazingly <laughs> average season. <laughs> oh man! I, hey, you know my thoughts on sheets. I. I I don't think he fits into the mindset or the or the way that Rafal wants to play or gets. And um, I, I hope somebody, I, I hope somebody makes it obvious with the type of spring that they have. And you know, and I hope it's not. And I'm not looking for Sheets to get hurt or anything. Absolutely not. I hope Sheets is healthy and he has a, has a great spring. But I hope someone just beats him out. You know, and. I think I think we're, I'm done as a, as a fan uh, from that experience. I, I'm with you on that one. I think I think it also opens up more possibilities. Like you mentioned, Danny Mendick a few minutes ago. Danny Mendick doesn't need to be the the 
backup infielder. He could be the utility guy if you don't have Very a roster true. spot yeah. being held by yep. a right field, first base, can't play defense guy. So it's yep. like you, if you don't have a sheets there, then you have the option to go Maldonado with fourth outfielder, a true backup infielder like a Sosa, and then a utility guy like a Mendick who can play some corner outfield, who can play some infield, or there's other guys that could make that roster spot as well. But I think not having sheets in the equation opens up a lot more possibilities with the bench and allows the team to be a little bit more creative with mixing and matching matchups and platooning and different situations like that. Can man, can Danny Mendick put the catcher's gear on? I thought he was, he was in line. The emergency he guy. Was. Yeah, he, he was, was the emergency catcher. Yep. There you yeah. go. Yep, 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 so, yep. There you go. You got a third catcher on the roster. Yeah, as, he's a magic man. Yeah, as my my son likes to call him the emergency backup catcher. Um <laughs> so uh I'm just going to throw this out there. Um, see, the difference here is that O'Hearn uh, didn't come from the White Sox, so uh, I kind of <laughs> I, I kind of don't see him turning it around anywhere else. Usually when guys are bad here, next place they go, they're even worse. So uh, that's just my opinion on that thing. Um, but, you know, maybe, he fi- maybe somebody finds a utility for him elsewhere. Uh, but I don't see it. Personally, um, yeah, I think that's a, a good place to stop for the evening, gentlemen. Hopefully, Yay. yeah, uh, futuresocks.net. <laughs> you can find all of our uh, material, uh, written and podcasts. Uh, Elijah Evans, thank you for being on tonight. Thanks Appreciate for coming you over. Uh, you have on Friday, you have an interview with White Sox prospect Edric Felix. Uh, you want to give a quick rundown on that real quick before uh, before I yeah, kick it off great. here? That was, a, that was a really cool interview. I'm hoping to, to relaunch some of my player interviews. I kind of had a bunch in the fall after the season and then kind of gave people their time over the holidays and all that time in the off season. Uh, so I'm getting back into that stuff now. Edric Felix was a great interview. He, uh, he talked about kind of growing up in Puerto Rico and what baseball was like there and how his transition over to the States and it's with – part of it just all things about how he became the player he is today and the person he is today it was a really awesome interview one of my favorite i've done actually with the white Sox prospect so that's coming out on friday um, and then you know looking into the future stay tuned with all different interviews coming up uh, in addition to the stuff we'll have in spring training because i'm hoping to talk to a lot of these guys that we you know talked about today so yeah absolutely if you guys have not been over uh to our to any of our podcast platforms that we that you can get stuff from and found uh, Elijah's interview series, uh, go and do so. There have been a lot of a lot of good ones. The Nestrini one was particularly awesome. Uh, Jacob Burke also good stuff. Uh, I, there there's been a lot of stuff that's been good. Um, so you know, looking forward to that series kicking off again this year, and that will be happening on Friday. Um, my name is Ian Eskridge at Daily White Sox on Twitter. Uh, Nick Murowski. At Nick underscore GGTB, uh, Danny Miller at Danny Miller FS, Elijah Evans at Elijah EV8. Um, thank you so much for coming and hanging out tonight. You can find this uh, in podcast form on any podcast platform that you uh, choose. Uh, you can also find this in video form again uh, on demand on YouTube. Uh, it will also be available on our Twitch uh, video feed as well. Um, you can support us via Patreon if you uh, like the content that we have been putting out here r- lately. Uh, you can find a link for that on our site. Um, thank you so much for hanging out tonight and uh, coming in the chat. We appreciate you guys. And uh, for the Major League Baseball Future Sox podcast here, uh, we all appreciate you. Have a great night, and we will talk to you soon. Thanks. It, oh, it, before we uh, Before we go, I just want to mention one last thing. If anybody was wondering, we are all, all four of us here on this screen are in the best shape of our lives going into the season here. So be prepared for some great content. I can, I, that's not true. (laughs) Is that accurate? (laughs) That is, that is inaccurate. Uh, All right. So you guys have a great night and we will talk to you guys next week. You have a good night. Thanks. Bye.